The talk I've been asked to give today was, is a talk about drugs in pouches. A lot of patients I've spoken to over the years, whether it be within gastroenterology or other specialities, when they're first starting medication, it's, they can be a bit perplexed. They have all of this medication, when to take it, um, how to take it, what doses, where to get further supplies from. And actually, while I was waiting for the session to start, I was actually sat quietly um, over listening to a conversation that a group was having at the back of the room, and they were talking about the loperamide and codeine and how they took it. So uh, from that conversation, I can kind of gleam some of the uh, issues people might have. But hopefully at the end of the talk, this diagram won't be uh, your, your state of mind, hopefully, sat on all, all your drugs feeling a bit perplexed. So... The aims of this session is to go over, have a little introduction, so why do you need medication, some of the different formulations that you might come into uh, contact with, and why those are appropriate and in different circumstances, where to find information and support. Um, medications used to reduce a bowel frequency and quantity, um, treatments for pouchitis and their side effects, safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, go over some of the other medications that you might encounter during your pouch journey, and look at prescription charges and the best way to economize and save money. So, introduction. Why is medication needed? So, for a lot of patients, um, the, when you have your pouch surgery, you're creating a, you're changing the function of your terminal ileum um, from absorption to a reservoir to take over from your rectum. Your terminal um, ileum will adapt over the course of time and you'll have a reduced frequency, um, but you still might need a little bit of pharmaceutical help to help thicken the output of your pouch. You might require some pain relief. You might require treatment to treat inflammation or to be weaned down from any um, drugs that you were taking for inflammation in the past. Um, you might need to be treated for any kinds of infections that might occur, um, and you might need to help um, to replace any losses, whether those be minerals or vitamins or um, water. The different formulations that are available. So a lot of them come in tablet or capsule formulation. We also have soluble tablets, um, or, and we also have tablets that are absorbed either sublingually under your tongue or on your buccal cavity. And we'll talk about that a little bit further on in the talk when we talk about loperamide. Um, we also have liquid and um, suspensions as well. The downfall of those is that a lot of them are designed to be sugar-free because we use a lot of those in our paediatric population. And they're because they're, with, they're designed with our paediatric population in mind, they might have lower concentrations. So adults would have to use high amounts. And because they're disguised for paediatric patients, we try to reduce sugar in, in, input in them. So we replace them, flavor them with artificial sweeteners, which actually could cause your bowel frequency to increase. So sometimes you have patients, and I've seen patients where I've gone to the ward, and they're using a bottle of loperamide a day, and, but then we're trying to fluid restrict them as well. So, okay, let's look at this and see what we can do. So just one of the downfalls of the liquid suspensions and suspensions that we have. Also enemas and suppositories, which I'm sure actually um, some of you are familiar with. So where to find information? First port of call, any medication that's legally dispensed within the UK, you should be provided with a patient information leaflet. The patient information leaflet, or, or as we call them in the industry, pills. I know. <laughs> Still makes me chuckle every time I say it. <laughs> Um, sorry, the geek, the geek inside coming out now. Um, so they're found inside the box. Everybody should have one, any medication. So when you get home, check, you should have one. So that should be your first port of call. If you have any questions about your medications, you pull out your pill. They're actually very comprehensive and straightforward and they're designed for a patient population in mind. So they're quite easy to read. Uh, obviously, you have your doctors, your nurses, and your pharmacists, not only within the hospital, but in the community as well. And if they don't know, I'm sure they can look into it and get back to you. Um, we also have online sites. Um, try to stick to NHS sites or anything that's credited by a charity. Um, Crohn's and Colitis UK are a good one, and NHS Choices, I've, some of my patients have reported they find those, um, that website quite useful as well. So now we'll move on to medications commonly used um, with pouch patients. Um, what I did, what we, what's been um, the norm is that we look at the most commonly used drugs and medications that the majority would be on. So hands up if anybody is on medication at the moment. 
I know I am. Don't be shy. Put your hands up. Yeah. So that's good. There's a whole. There's a good cohort of us um, here today. So. Um, why, why do we use, all the most commonly used medications are found to reduce the bowel frequency, and these are loperamide and codeine, and um, medications used to treat pouchitis, so antibiotics and probiotics. So we'll start with loperamide and codeine. So how do they work? I know a lot of you in this room are on loperamide and, and codeine. They act on what we call a mu receptor, a mu opioid receptor. So those are the same kind of receptors that uh, things like morphine um, act on as well, but loperamide and codeine act on these as well. When they act on these receptors, what it, it causes the bowel to um, reduce in its, um, the, the motion of the bowel reduces and the bowel slows down. When the bowel slows down, you increase the amount of contact time that any ingested material has with the surface, um, with the surface of your lumen which allows more time for absorption of water and any nutrients that you've ingested, and hence then reduces the amount of contents that you have coming back. So I've tried to break it down and not put any of the geekiness inside it. So that's just a basic mode of action for you. And the desired effect um, is that you reduce the frequency and quantity um, of your stoma output, or sorry, of the pouch output. So why take one over the other? What's the benefits of loperamide versus codeine? So loperamide, um, initially you start at a dose of two milligrams up to four times a day when needed. However, in, the, in high output stomas or high output pouches, we can go up to um, 16 milligrams four times a day. Loperamide tends to be our first line. It's more favorable than codeine because you're not getting, even though they're acting on the same receptors, Loperamide doesn't cross what we call the blood-brain barrier, so we don't have all of the central nervous um, effects of drowsiness and sedation, and it only tends to be more gut-specific. So that's why we try to use codeine as our first line, and you're not going to get some of the side effects that you'll see. Uh, sorry, loperamide is our first line, and you're not going to get some of the side effects that you'll see with codeine. Loperamide capsules, which tends to be our first line. However, it has been reported, and I've... Um, <laughs> Um, one of my favourite encounters on a ward was a patient chasing me down with her stoma bag saying, see, pharmacist, I told you the tablets, the capsules are coming out in my bag. And I was like, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's see what we can do about that. Um, so especially patients with very fast transit, um, they have noted or reported that um, the capsules will come out whole, either in their stoma bag or they'll see it in the toilet when they flush the toilet. So... Um, looking into it and doing some research and talking to some drug companies about it, um, it could be the case where actually you're getting a ghost tablet, as they called it, where actually the drug has been um, 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 absorbed or is insoluble and you've taken and it, it's, um, you've had, it's, create, it's exerted its mode of action. Um, or it actually could be the case where it's transiting through. So in that case, then, you'd be looking at the effect that you're getting in, um, with your output. So actually, if you are taking capsules and you're seeing them come through, but actually you're getting the desired effect, then there's nothing really to worry about. But if you're not getting the desired effect, you can move to different formulations. So tablets are another formulation that we can use and are quite readily available. Um, liquids, but we spoke about the problematic, um, the problems with liquids. Um, and also melts. So melts are tablets that dissolve in your, in your buccal cavity um, and your, um, the medication um, moves from your buccal cavity into your systemic circulation and creates the effect. Um, but um, the effectivity of those in comparison to the tablets and capsules are still up for question. Some patients find them um, useful, some patients don't. So ideally, um, when we, we can use capsules or you can open the capsules and dissolve them and take them that way, or tablets tend to be the mainstay in hospital at the moment. But more work will be need to be done. Codeine, um, doses between 30 to 60 milligrams four times a day. Um, it's, ideally, we should not be exceeding the maximum dose of codeine. Um, as you all know here, and from the conversation I, I heard earlier on, which I'm so glad I, I heard this conversation, um, you can taper your doses of loperamide and codeine to meet your output and to meet your, um, of your, either your pouch or your stoma. So actually, if you know that 
30 milligrams twice a day works for you, great, that's your dose. And if you know that actually you need the higher dose um, spectrum, that's your dose. So a lot of the times your doctors and your nurses will help you tailor your loperamide and codeine regimens to suit you and suit your bodies as we're all very individual. Um, it also can be used for pain relief. Um, and it comes in a combination with paracetamol how, um, in the form of cocodamol. However, if you take it in combination with paracetamol, then you don't have the finesse of being able to adapt the dose of codeine and also adapt the dose of paracetamol. So it's probably not recommended that you use cocodamol unless you're on a very stable dose and you know that you're taking the full whack of codeine at 60 milligrams four times a day and you're taking a full whack of paracetamol, then maybe that will help because you're reducing your tablet burden. But until you are stable, um, it's probably best not to use a combination tablet. Uh, some patients find the combination of loperamide and codeine better, and it works better for them. So there is the option to have combination um, of using loperamide and codeine together. So how to take them? Just some hints and tips. Ideally, you want to be taking them 30 minutes to one hour before meals to allow the drug to work before eating. Um, side effects? I, Side effects are listed for all drugs. And again, if you look in your pill when you go home and you look at your medications, some of the side effects, I've had calls off patients saying, I'm not taking this drug because it can cause my hair, uh, my hair to fall out. And I was like, don't worry, it doesn't happen to everybody. And that's the same with all side effects. They don't happen to everybody. But with the higher the doses that you use, the more likely you are to experience side effects. Um, so I've listed some of the common side effects, but again, they might not happen to you, and some of you in the room who've taken the medication might not have experienced those side effects at all. So it's really a balance between getting your dose correct and um, the side effects. So with loperamide, it's abdominal pain, bloating, nausea, and flatulence. With, co uh, with codeine, it's drowsiness, headaches, low blood pressure, nausea, and vomiting. You can buy loperamide over the counter, um, and a lot of the times when you might have um, you might have had your medication, your loperamide dispensed by a pharmacy, or you've read the information leaflet, and it says do not exceed more than eight in a 24-hour period. Ignore that; <laughs> it's fine. You can go up to um, um, 16 milligrams once a day. Um, codeine, ideally, um, is only prescribable, so it would be your GPs or your hospital that would be able to um, issue you with codeine. So, um, we'll move on to medication used to, um, in the treatment of pouchitis. As you all know, pouchitis is an inflammation of the pouch. Why does pouchitis occur? Many, um, um, many reasons. One of them may be um, because you are having, um, because the, um, when you change the, um, the use of your terminal ileum into that of a reservoir to, to replace the rectum, um, your, um, the membrane of, of the lumen becomes more permeable to bacteria. So that's why a lot of um, we use back, um, antibiotics as our mainstay of treatment of pouchitis. Um, first line would be ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams twice a day for 14 days, or metronidazole, um, 400 milligrams three times a day for four days. Why, are these, why were these antibiotics chosen? These antibiotics were chosen because they either kill or slow down the um, growth of the most common kinds of bacteria that you will find to have infected the pouch. Um, so lots of research has been done over many years, and they've chosen these two because they're the most likely to treat the bugs that will cause your pouchitis. So there's been a lot of thought and reason. And the duration was picked um, because you needed a long period of time to clear um, those bacteria. And the frequency, um, so four twice a day or three times a day, was picked because you need certain levels of the drugs in your body. Um, if you have a rapid relapse, you might then, so, or if you have three episodes of um, pouchitis in a year, they might, um, you might have a combination of the two of the ciprofloxacin and the metronidazole together, and the period and your course extended from 14 days to 28 days. You might, some, of the, some patients might require maintenance therapy to prevent them from re relapsing. So just have a constant level of, of, of an antibiotic in their system just to prevent a relapse. <coughs> the, uh, the drug of choice tends to be ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams twice a day. There's lots of research that have come out, has come out to support the use of a probiotic. I know Evie, in her talk, um, probably spoke to you about probiotics. So the probiotic of choice for us is VSL hashtag free, um, and it's four sachets a day, 
Um, and there's been some benefits um, uh, described in some patients with pouchitis. Um, and that's and the probiotics ideally should be used when a patient has, um, when they're in remission and we're just trying to maintain them. So you're, on the main, so you're in remission of your pouchitis, you're on a maintenance dose, and then you add in the probiotic, and that is ideal from all of the clinical trials that have been done and all the evidence gathered, that is the best time when your probiotic is going to work. However, you, when you have, you have some patients who are on maintenance, and for some whatever reason, they're still relapsing, or they relapse when they're on a maintenance dose of an antibiotic and a probiotic. And for those patients, um, microbiology will be involved um, at all stages actually before we step you up microbiology will be involved they'll be tested to see if there's any of the reasons why you're relapsing um, so as you go further down different antibiotics might be tried one that we use is comoxiclav um, and the, or you might be using a combination of two so you might be using um, one for two weeks another one for another two weeks but at this stage, microbiology will be heavily involved and, you'll be, and everything will be tailored towards you and the, um, my, um, and the bugs that we can, we can find and isolate and grow. So how to take them. This is so important. I'm sure you've probably all heard in the news recently that we're running out of antibiotics and antibiotic stewardship and not to take antibiotics unless you need them. But you or some people with pouchitis, we'll need them. But how can we protect ourselves then from resistance? We need to take them on a regular basis. So when I say regular, take them at the same time each day. Find a time that fits in with your lifestyle. This is what I tell all patients. There's no point in saying I'm going to take it at X o'clock, but then you know that at one o'clock you're always busy running around doing this or the other. So make sure it fits in with your lifestyle. Um, don't miss any doses, ideally. If you miss a dose, it depends on how um, far away your dose is. Um, either take the dose, if it's within a X amount of time, you can take the dose, or if it's nearer to you the dose, just leave it and take your next dose. Finish your course. If you've been given a two-week course, finish your two-week course. 28 days course, finish your 28 day course. I know it can be um, tiresome taking medication, but it's for your own good, because ideally what we'd want to avoid is my antimicrobial resistance and um, which potentially could cause relapse um, or having to treatment <coughs> escalate you. Um, just to go over some side effects of some of the um, commonly used um, antibiotics. So metronidazole, you can get a metallic taste in your mouth. I've been told by some patients it's like sucking on coins, um, so it's not very pleasant. Um, alcohol, if you take one thing home about metronidazole, do not drink alcohol with metronidazole. It can cause flushing, dizziness, it can even cause you to faint. And not only don't take alcohol when you're taking metronidazole, but not for 48 hours after you've finished. And that's because you have a certain level of metronidazole in your body for 48 hours after you finish taking the course. So if you then drink alcohol when you take it, you're still going to potentially be exposed to the side effects of flushing, fainting and discomfort. It may cause, in high doses and long courses, it might cause, cause nerve damage to your hands and your feet, cramps, pains, um, spasms and weaknesses. However, it doesn't occur to everybody, but the alcohol does, so no alcohol, please. <laughs> um, ciprofloxacin, um, dizziness, avoid sunlight. If you are going on a lovely tropical holiday, which I'm very jealous of, wear lots of sun, sun cream, even if you have darker skin, skin tones. Um, seizures, rarely, it causes... Um, if you're on diabetic, if you're on any epileptic medication, that will be taken into consideration, so don't worry about that. Um, atropy, if you're under 16, um, and tendonitis over 60s. Um, avoid taking iron, calcium, and dairy products at the same time, because it could um, st almost, it could, they surround the ciprofloxacin molecules and prevent the body from absorbing them. So I would try to leave an hour between um, um, calcium supplements, dairy products, and iron um, either side of your ciprofloxacin dose. But we want you to obviously have a balanced diet, so please just all do eat those things. Um, Coamoxiclav. Um, Coamoxiclav um, contains two elements. Paris, um, a, it contains a penicillin and also a, um, another element that prevents... So if you do have a resistant penicillin, it will dampen down that resistant penicillin and enable the penicillin to act. 
main side effect, nausea and vomiting. However, if you do have a penicillin allergy, make sure you tell any healthcare professional you come in contact with that you do have a penicillin allergy. Sometimes side effects are mistaken for allergies. Um, so, we called, so when we are looking for allergies, we try to use the term a true allergy, so an anaphylactic reaction rather than nausea and vomiting, because actually you might need a penicillin and it's probably more effective than something else, but then if it's the case where you've had nausea and vomiting, which is more of a side effect, um, then we can still give you the antibiotic, but just keep an eye on you. Um, it might cause liver problems in the over 60s, and if you're male, you're at higher risk, but, and also if you've had a prolonged um, course. But again, it doesn't happen to everybody. So just to touch on probiotics, I won't go into too much details about this. Um, over the years working in gastroenterology, I've had several calls come through to pharmacy to say, can we prescribe probiotics on um, prescriptions? So um, the Department of Health work very closely with the Advisory Committee on Borderline Substances. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them. But they are a board who are designed to um, advise the Department of Health um, as to when um, food supplements and toiletries can be considered as medicinal products. So um, probiotics have had the review, and the board has said that, yes, they can be considered as medicinal product if they are um, used under the supervision of a clinician uh, for the maintenance <coughs> of um, the maintenance of remission of an, that's, sorry, should be a little bit lower, of, an, of a pouch induced by antibacterials in adults. Um, and if the, f the GP endorses it a B a C B S on an FB10, then the pharmacy won't query it and it won't be queried by um, the prescription pricing authority when it goes off to, for payment. Um, however, you can also buy um, um, this probiotic over the counter from many pharmacies and health food stores. Um, it contains eight strains of live um, probiotics, but it also contains traces of soya, gluten, and lactose. So if you have been told that you have, for instance, celiac disease, or you're lactose intolerant, or you're intolerant to soya, just be careful and read the packet before you buy anything over the counter. So pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, there are many women of um, childbearing age who um, will require medications to treat their pouches. Um, so don't worry, because if you are pregnant or if, you are, if you're intending to get pregnant or you're breastfeeding, we can look at the medication that you're using and we weigh up the risks versus the benefits. Um, so don't be scared. You can approach your team, you can ask your team um, and they can do a review of your medication. The kind of things that they'll use is there's no clinical trials per se in, in, in pregnancy and um, breastfeeding because it's unethical and we can't do clinical trials in that po um, patient population. A lot of animal data is used. Um, you'll be surprised to find out that actually the animals that most closely resemble us are rats, so there's lots of animal data that comes from rats. However, sometimes it's difficult to extrapolate the data that we find to humans for multiple reasons. Um, however, you can look at your base, go back to your basic principles. So if you come to your team and you say, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant or I want to breastfeed, they can go back and look at the drugs and they're using the basic principles. So does it cross the placenta? Well, is it extracted in breast milk? Is it fat soluble? Is it more likely to come out in breast milk? So we can use all of those to kind of weigh up um, your risks and benefits. And we know your condition, so it's very much, okay, we need this. It's m not likely to really affect the infant. So maybe we can use it and we'll closely monitor you more closely. So those are the kind of reviews that you can do here within the hospital of your GP surgery. So just to run through quickly, um, I know these slides are going to go out. Um, so just so you've got them, leperamide is considered safe um, in pregnancy. Codeine um, is considered not so, so great, and neither is metronidazole or ciprofloxacin, and coamoxiclav is considered safe. In breastfeeding, leperamide is considered safe again. Codeine, metronidazole, and ciprofloxacin, not so, but um, coamoxiclav is. So I'll run through some of the medication that you might um, have come in contact with during your um, pouch journey. Um, so amitriptyline. 
Amitriptyline is um, considered an antidepressant, but in very low doses. We talked about side effects earlier on. One of the side effects of amitriptyline is it slows down your gut transit and also helps relieve neuropathic pain. So we do use a low dose and we are utilizing that side effect to slow down, so hence reduce the frequency and the volume of any output and also um, for any neuropathic pain that you might be experiencing as well. Ispohula husk, um, it's actually considered a laxative, but it's a bulk forming laxative, so it's quite high in fiber. So if you've been, if you've been told you've got to have to have a low fiber diet, um, then this is one to avoid because it does ca um, cause bloating and flatulence, but it's there to bulk up the stool and again help reduce the frequency and the volume of any output. Steroids, some patients might have their surgery, they might be weaning down on a dose of steroids um, f um, that was there before that they had their surgery. So some patients might be still tapering down their dose of steroids. Um, we spoke earlier on about microbiology being involved um, when you are a patient who has um, relapsed from a maintenance dose of antibiotics. Um, and nitrofurantoin, it could be one of the antibiotics that Micro would recommend again because it's known to treat the, um, the bugs that um, have effect, well, uh, are most likely to affect um, the, your pouch. Vitamin B12, um, your terminal ileum is where vitamin B12 is absorbed and sometimes you get a reduction, so that's injected intramuscularly, your vitamin B12. Mesalazines, there to treat the cuff of your pouch. Um, so um, instead of giving an oral dose, we are looking for a topical effect. Um, so you might be given um, that in the form of a suppository or an enema. More likely a suppository because it's, the contact time will be longer with the cuff um, than an enema. Um, GTN um, or the tyrosine to help um, increase the blood flow to um, any fistulas that you might have. Paracetamol for pain, um, buscopan for any kind of cramping. Diorolite or St. Mark's electrolyte mix solution um, is there to replace any kind of losses you have, help the reabsorption of water and also reduce output. And um, cholestyramine and cholecevalam, if you've ever been told you've got bile, um, um, bile salt malabsorption, is there to bind the bile salts and reduce your um, diarrhea. If you could take one thing away from other medications is to avoid NSAIDs, especially drugs like ibuprofen and diclofenac. Um, because they might cause ulceration in the pouch and with potential bleeding. So no NSAIDs. Um, prescription charging. So prescriptions are expensive, and if you're having to collect prescriptions on a regular basis, um, the website I've, I've put up there is a really great website. It gives you information about the prices of prescription and it also gives you all of the information I'm about to go through in my next few slides. So if you want to go back and read up about it, that's the best website that I found when I was doing my research um, for this. So as of the 1st of April 2017, the prescription charge price is £8.60p per item. And when I say per item, Let's take loperamide for an example. Loperamide, if you have a loperamide, so you've got the same drug and they're capsules, so the same formulation. And even if you have eight boxes or you have one box, the, the pharmacy will charge you um, £8.60. However, if you go to your GP and say, I think my capsules are coming out in my stoma bag, I want to try tablets. If the GP then gives you loperamide capsules and loperamide cap and tablets, that's considered two items, so you'd be charged for each of them. So don't get stung by that, because I have I had, when I've done locums and given out drugs in community pharmacies, people um, have not really expected the two charges because they're different formulations. Um, and you will be charged in local pharmacies and also in the hospital pharmacy as well. So who's exempt? So if you flip to the back of your FP10s, which are the green prescriptions that you get from your GP surgeries, um, you'll find a list of exemptions. So for this, um, um, cohort of um, patients here today. Um, if you have a specific medical condition um, and have a valid medical exemption certificate, you are exempt from paying a prescription charge. You can apply for the, your medical exemptions um, certificate via this website here or via your GP or get the information from a local <coughs> pharmacy and they can help you fill out to get your medical exemption um, um, certificate. And here is the information I've um, on the back of the FP10. 
and for yourselves it would be a permanent fissure such as a um, colostomy, ileostomy, um, that you can apply for a, um, a medical exemption certificate. However, if you have a comorbidity, so for instance if you have diabetes um, and you, um, you can still use your medical exemption certificate for all of the drugs that you'll use to cover your pouch. So it's not, they won't go and look for your meds and say, okay, you're exempt for your diabetic medications, but you're not exempt from anything else. Everything is then covered in your care. However, so what if you have a chronic condition, um, but you don't fall into the exemptions? Um, it's still pricey to pay for a prescription at £8.60 per item. So you can use um, a prepayment card. So these are prescription prepayment certificates, also known as PPCs. So for three months, it's um, about £30. And you'll, you'll see a saving if you're um, having, uh, requiring more than four items in a three-month period. You can have a 12-month exemption card, and, you st and it's roughly £100. And you'll start to realise savings if you are requiring more than 13 items per year. Um, how do you get hold of these cards? You can apply for them via your community pharmacy, your GP surgery. You can do it online via the website um, that I listed earlier on. And also on the website, if you are not computer savvy, you can also call a hotline and they'll um, help you apply for your certificate there as well. Your certificate starts from the day that you submit your application or your application reaches, for instance, if you've done it via post. Um, however, you won't have the certificate with you. So let's say that I go online today and I apply for my certificate and, it's, um, and it goes through and it's valid from today. And then let's say tomorrow I get a prescription. If I go to a pharmacy and have my prescription dispensed tomorrow, because I know I paid for my certificate yesterday, I can ask for the pharmacy for a, a, a refund form. And um, as long as you apply for your refund within three months and all of the details, I went and found one from my local pharmacy or on there and it's very simple to follow, you can get your money back against your, pre um, your certificate. So as soon as you um, get your certificate and um, then you're fine to have the medication dispensed. Um, also as well, if you go for, a, which is something else I found out, if you go for a 12-month um, uh, certificate, you can pay by direct debit, so it doesn't always have to come out in one lump sum, so it can come out over the period of, a, um, over the course of the year, which is actually quite good as well. So just to recap, we went through the introduction, why medication is needed, looked at some different formulations and some of their pitfalls, where to find information, medications that can be used to reduce bowel functions, um, medication to treat pouchitis and their side effects, safety in pregnancies, other medications and prescription charges. Thank you for the invite to come and talk today. Thank you for listening and any questions. Um, yeah, it, it has been, yeah, and some people, yeah, so some people, I've, I've known patients um, where, um, so we look, patients that have been looked after in the same trust, because they've come from different geographical areas within London, some areas in London have said, fine, we'll do it, and they've been granted a certificate, other areas have been more reluctant to do it, and they've had more of a struggle or haven't been granted them. So I, there does need to be some standardisation. And I know that the Crohn's and Colitis UK organisation have been doing a lot of work um, in order to have um, IBD patients um, listed as a chronic condition to have exemption certificates. So I know there's lots of work going <coughs> on in the background and hopefully it won't be, more, it won't be such a postcode lottery. But yeah, I'm really happy that you got yours sorted. Yeah. Can I just say something? We've done several articles in your on this as well, and we actually have letters, um, certainly from a regional health authority, approving of um, people with pouches mm -hmm. that they can get exemption. <clears throat> so, I mean, it doesn't always work. I say that straight away. Mm -hmm. But if anybody wants, you know, one of these letters, 
Um, it was actually signed by a former chairman of, of the group, who was a, who was a GP. Um, I'll happily send it to you, so do get in touch if you want one to try and get a exemption. Once the GP signed it off, it's not going to be questioned. No, no, no. No, no. Yeah. So once the GP signed it off, then they, they should understand, shouldn't they? Yeah. If they don't know what the pouches if it's explained, then hopefully yeah. they understand the other side off. I actually went the other way. When I had an ileostomy, I had a mm. Once I got the, um, the reversal. Um, Anyway, don't they? Only yeah, and then you they, they have to review them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is and this is why. So you probably worked your way through that whole Everything process, yeah, yeah. The and then you got to the end. So it's just yeah, and you might have had some people in this room who've never had any form of pouchitis, or you have somebody who has, and actually at some way in that pathway it's worked for them. So on, only if their disease state requires it. Um, so it's very individualized. So it would, it would be dangerous to say, oh, yes, you've got pouchitis, go straight to this until they've worked through. Because there could be other causes, and those need to be excluded before then going straight to steroids. Because the way steroids work is they completely dampen down your immune system, and we need to make sure you're safe for that to happen before it's given.